afternoon, good evening. Uh, welcome one, welcome all, whether you're live on um, Zoom or whether you're live on YouTube or whether you're watching at another point in time. I want to thank you for coming together to study God's word and hope and pray that you're studying more and preparing. We are living in solemn times and um, Jesus is about to come and the events are uh, rapidly moving. The final events are rapidly moving, as we have been told. I hope that you're um, watching all of this uh, as we are studying here, and you can study more and you can understand the times that we're living in. So I hope and pray that you'll be encouraged to continue this study on uh, prophecylife.org. And uh, all the other studies are also posted there. Uh, today's um, week number 25. This is the 25th presentation running into the sixth month right now since the lockdown happened. We, the Lord inspired us to start this in the month of May. The very first week of May we started and uh, here we go. By the grace of God, we are journeying on and the time is running. Running ahead of us, so to speak. No. So, before we begin, let us uh, pray. Mighty God, merciful, kind, and loving Heavenly Father, we fall at your throne of grace and mercy, seeking your favor. I pray, O Lord, that you would open our eyes that we may see you and open our ears that we may hear you. Speak to us, O Lord, enlighten us and fill us with your spirit. I pray that you would forgive me, cleanse me, make me whole, make me worthy to be your mouthpiece. Thank you for your inspiration you have given to put this together. And I pray, O Lord, that you'll take charge of all our devices, wherever we are, that we could uh, uh, be enlightened and that your spirit will take control and lead us into all understanding. I pray that uh, Satan and his angels will be kept out of all our places and our devices so that our concentration will be undivided and we could understand your words. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So here we are on part four, which is the conclusion of the seven trumpets and uh, the previous three sessions, the last three weeks that we studied, beginning with the, the prelude to the seven trumpets, which is Revelation 8, 2 to 5. And then we have the seven trumpets coming through. We did six in the four, uh, in three parts so far, and we're going to finish with the seven trumpet, but we're going to touch the interlude now, primarily before we go to the final, which is the seventh trumpet. So the interlude is chapter 10 and chapter 11, verses 1 to 14. That's where we're going to see. So here at prophecylife.org, we are always learning from the past so that we can understand the present and therefore prepare for the future. And outreach tool is always available. A soft copy is there on the website, prophecylife.org. If you want our hard copy, you can get in touch with us and we will help you get it. And I always tell you that the theme is the great controversy that happened over the Ark of the Covenant, which is the Ark of Hope for us. And therefore, we need to enter into that. And today, and from since the beginning it happened, it's all about worship. Who will you worship and who will you choose to worship? Options are only two. The God who created heaven and earth and all that in them there is. And Satan. Two options. So get into this arc because it's all happening and we're going to see this in every study more or less. In fact, today you're going to see it more happening in this study. So study more, understand and prepare for this time. This is where we are in time. It's all happening in the sanctuary. Psalm 77, 13, that is why God is telling Thy way, our Lord, is in the sanctuary, and how great a God is our God that He has revealed it. The sanctuary is the blueprint for salvation. If you want to understand how salvation is, study the sanctuary, and that's what God has given the Seventh day Adventist Church the understanding to proclaim. So, now before we go into the study, we just have our health snippet, which we always give week after week. We are in the third round of the New Start acronym, and we are on rest. And today we're going to focus on weekly rest. Okay, we'll look at the weekly rest. As an introduction, I want to say this weekly rest is what God instituted for human beings when he created this world. Six days of creation, one day he says it's rested. You can read in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, 
gives a little more detail of all those uh, details that God wants us to understand. So now this rest is profound. Let us understand about the weekly rest, six days work, one day rest. So in addition to sleeping each night, which is the rest we talked about in our last week, uh, not last week, but last round on the new start rest topic, we talked about the daily rest. Today we're talking about the weekly rest. So we need a weekly day of rest, just as the body has a natural daily clock, circadian rhythm. It also has a weekly call, weekly clock, which is circa septum rhythm. Now the circa septum rhythms are just that body rhythms that run about seven days in length. We're talking about science here, which God created. It is not some science that has evolved. This science is what God created, and we call it science today in our language. So these have an important play, and that is why God designed it so. Now let me tell you about this weekly rest, how and where you can find about it. And you can read that in Genesis chapter 2, 1 to 3, and Exodus chapter 20, 1 to 8. And that is talking about the weekly rest and you can study throughout the bible it talks about it and you can study about anywhere scientific research everybody talks you need this rest so now because god made it so and such a priority is one of the beauties of god's sabbath commandment now if you work in the nhs i work in the nhs and um, that is called national health service meaning hospitals and medical uh, institutions and it says here and adult workers are entitled to one day of a week one day of a week you're entitled it depends on how many hours you work that many days you get off but if you work a routine shift which would be daytime work you get a one day off when you have work a little bit extended periods of the day you get two weeks off that is what is happening right now but the standard protocol says you have to have one day off and you would see that around the world in any work pattern and uh, let's look at this experiment that someone tried to do someone tried to defy what god set in place for human beings to be in health and have all the benefits that he knew they would require somebody decided let's do an experiment and see if we can change that and so they did this they rise at 5 4 30 in the morning and prepare themselves for work. So 5 to 6.30, 90 minutes of focused work. And then from 6.30 to 9 a.m., they go to the gym, breakfast, shower, etc. And then from 9 to 11.30, two and a half hours of focused work. And then from 11.30 to 3 p.m., they have lunch and then extended rest period and so on and so forth. And again, 3 to 4.30, 90 minutes of focused work. For seven days, they were doing this pattern. And after 4.30, again, they have rest, recreation, and then go to sleep. That's what they were doing, meaning dinner and so on and so forth. For want of space, I didn't put all those details. That is what was happening every day, seven days a week. The results of the seven work week routine was burnout. Even with the lots of breaks in the day. So the hypothesis that a couple of extra hours during the day and fewer overall daily working hours would be enough was invalidated. So the wisdom of the six days of work and one day of rest, that is what has been determined after this experiment. So what are the takeaways they got from this experiment? From trying a seven day work week is, despite the conclusion that rest is important, a single day is the perfect amount and no more. Working to consistently live by this method for all of the weeks during the year is the key to success. That is the deduction of the study of the experiment that was done. And I want to recommend that because God set it so. And if you try to play around with God has set in place, who will lose? Not God. He doesn't lose because he's not playing. He has set it in cycle and motion. It is the one who transgresses it or changes it or does differently will be the loser. So I don't want to be the loser. So I follow what God set in place in science and for humanity and for health. So now here, I just want to retreat to say that God created the seventh day and established the Sabbath rest. 
and look at the benefits. The benefits are physical health and mental health. That is the benefits. And there are 12 listed here. You can find more if you want to. Let's look at the physical benefits, which I call physical transformation. Time out reduces stress. If you take that one day rest, it reduces your stress. Time, number two, time out gives you a chance to move. And number three, completely divesting from work on a weekly basis, what does it do? It reduces inflammation and the risk of heart disease. Number four, getting away from work boosts immune system. So that one day of rest boosts your immune system, which is needed very much, especially in this coronavirus pandemic. Your immune needs to be strong. So even if you um, contact or contract the coronavirus, COVID-19, you will not die of it if your immune system is strong. Number five, you'll sleep better during time out of work. And number six, your active time off adds years to your life. Those are the physical benefits. What about the mental and emotional benefits? Let's look at them. Number seven, regular time away from work restores mental energy because your mind needs that rest too. Every part of your body needs that rest too. Number eight, take out time for yourself and you are more creative. So when you go back after that weekly rest, beginning on the Monday, the first day of your working week, you would see or Sunday for many people. Some people work uh, six days. So Sunday is your first day of work. When you go back after this weekly rest, you are more creative, more productive. Uh, well, that's point number nine. More productive if weekly time out from work. If you try seven days, you get burnt out. Number 10, you'll focus better at work if you take your weekly rejuvenation time. And number 11, your day off improves short-term memory. Anybody struggling with memory? This is the recommendation. Number 12, with regular time away from work, you might even love your job again if you're not happy because you're working seven days. I would recommend take what God established when he created man and he knows best. So can we trust Bible prophecy? We again come up with this question all the time and we will present it because we have countless number of evidences we can trust the bible the word of god so here is a picture of a uh, image that they created on um, in a place with a lot of these uh, images all around it's kind of a small village of this uh, gigantic um, um, what they call dinosaurs in common term terminology now that's a picture of one of those images and um, this is described in job 40 15 to 24. So does the Bible describe the dinosaurs? Yes, it describes. You find it in Job chapter 40, 15 to 24. So if you go to many museums even, you would find gigantic um, fossils or the skeletons of these gigantic dinosaurs. They existed before the flood, which we also talked about as evidence that the Bible is true. Before the flood, these existed because before the flood, human beings were as giants as well. After the flood, the stature and age of man was reduced. So, the Bible is true. So, now the seven trumpets, judgments timeline. Quickly, we'll run through this. The first trumpet, one third of grass burnt up. Second trumpet, a flaming mountain falls and one third of the sea turns blood. And then in the third trumpet, you have a burning star that falls okay, into the sea. And then you see one third of the water turns bitter because this star is called wormwood. We studied about that. And then you have the fourth one, which is uh, the sun and moon and stars. The heavenly bodies are darkened, which gives us understanding of the darkening of the light, which we studied. Again, you can check in trumpet number five. You see the rise of Islam represented by the locusts that are being presented there and that are swarming. And then number six, we saw the Islam becoming a religious political power and attacking and destroying the Eastern Roman Empire again. So now there is, that's what we have. And then we have an interlude, which is chapter 10, where a mighty angel with the little book and the seven thunders and two witnesses are mentioned in chapter 11 and one to 14. And then you have the seventh angel, which is the mystery of God finished. So we're going to do the interlude and the seventh trumpet today. 
Now, these are the timelines. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea, the church time periods which were under the Roman Empire. The first three churches under the Roman Empire. The next two were under the Roman uh, Catholic Papal Dominion. And then the last two were the time period of the Jesuits of Rome. And that is how the seals and trumpets worked as well. So first time period being 31 AD when Jesus ascended till 100 AD. And second time period, 100 to 313. Third time period, 313 to 538. And the fourth time period, which is the fourth church, Thyatira, 538 AD to 1517 and 1517 to 1755 and then fifth, sixth one, 1755 to 1844 and 1844 to the second advent. So we're going to look at the last two time periods in this seven trumpets, how it came to an end. We saw in the sixth trumpet, but we're going to touch a little bit there and then look at the final time period in these trumpets. So just to recap again on the trumpets, as we close today on the trumpet topic, the first trumpet is the first enemy being destroyed, meaning Jerusalem, which happened in AD 70. The seven trumpets, by the way, again, let me say this, is the time period or the three enemies of Jesus and how they are destroyed. Okay, so the second trumpet is the destruction of the second enemy, which is pagan Rome, the Roman Empire, so to speak. And third trumpet to the seventh trumpet is the time period of papal Rome, which comes up after the fall of Rome in Western Rome in AD 476 and will be destroyed subsequently, which we will touch in this study of the seventh trumpet just before Jesus coming. So that is the essence of the trumpets. Now let's look at the interlude. The interlude is Revelation 10 and 11 and the Advent movement. Advent means second coming movement people and what happened in that time periods so let's look at this so revelation chapter 10 and 11 tells the story of the rise of the seventh day adventism okay the rise of the seventh day adventist movement or the rise of the seventh day adventist church so any seventh day adventist should understand this in details because no other church no other church no other church can fit into this description. No other church can fit into this description. The events that transpire in Revelation 10 and 11, and therefore, consequently, Revelation 12, Revelation 12, 17. Okay, that is the crowning identifying mark. But the movements and the race happens here, and no church that's on planet Earth can prove themselves to fit into this description in revelation 10 and 11 so let us study this so the key bible text which validate the seventh day adventist church its mission and the foundational doctrine of the sanctuary are found in these chapters this is the turn parallels and sustains the three angels messages found in revelation chapter 14 in other words the foundation of adventism is in these texts so let's just uh, have a snapshot of the prelude to the seventh trumpet. So as the vision of the 144,000 and the great multitude is chapter seven was an interlude between the sixth and seventh seals of Revelation 10, one to 11, 14 constitutes a pause between the sixth and the seven trumpets. So that's a interlude. The timing of this interlude is the 1840s. During the early 1800s, the power of the Ottoman empire was waning and a spiritual revival known as the Great Awakening took place and atheism was becoming much more widespread too. While God was working, Satan also is working. Double force. You can see this throughout history. So now, Revelation 11, 7 to 10, the stage was now set for the final judgment of the seventh trumpet as found in Revelation 11, 15 to 19. We're going to study these chapters now. So now, let's look at the prelude beginning at Revelation 10, verse 1 to 4. And this describes the mighty angel from heaven. So, and I saw a mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, a rainbow was upon his head, and his face as it were the sun, and his feet as the pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book open and set his foot upon the sea, and his left foot on the earth, and cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices, 
And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered and write them not. Okay. Let us understand this passage. Let us understand this passage in detail. By the grace of God, today we have the knowledge that God has revealed to us for us to understand. So the description of this mighty angel is different and more glorious than the other angels in Revelation. He is clothed with a cloud and a rainbow was upon his head and his face as it were the sun and his feet as the pillars of fire. So the similarity of the description of Christ you see in Revelation 1, 13 to 16 as the prelude to the churches. Many to believe that this angel must be Christ. Not must be, it is Christ. The same rainbow we see around the throne in Revelation 4. That is the prelude to the seven seals. It glows about his head, a token of his covenant of love. The cloud is also a token of deity. Clouds and glory covered him in Sinai and they are his chariot. Okay, you have various descriptions talking about Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ, the book Revelation is all about Jesus Christ. The very first verse talks about that. It is about Jesus Christ and his revelation. So now to the prelude of the churches, you have Revelation 1. To the prelude of the seals, you have Revelation 4 and 5. And to the prelude of the trumpets, you have Revelation 8 verses 2 to 5. Okay, so that's what we can understand. So now let's continue about this mighty angel. The mighty angel is standing on both the sea and the earth, signifying that the message he brings is of worldwide significance. So this message is contained in a little open book. Okay, that's what we read. Now let us understand this. So the face that is little open is open, shows that it was once closed. So the book of Daniel was by divine direction closed up and sealed till the time of the end when the wise were to understand. You can read that in Daniel chapter 12 verses 4 to 10. Here this book is open showing that the book of Daniel has been unsealed bringing us to the experience of 1844. You can read Daniel 814, 925 for the meaning of the 2300 day years and 1844 and also you can read chapter ezekiel 2 9 to 3 till chapter 3 and this is amazing we'll touch that a little bit it talks about this book that has to be eaten okay now let's look at another uh, uh, phrase that was said that the book was closed and now open let's understand this so both john and daniel saw a glorious heavenly being both deal with time there is one key difference. In Daniel, the book is closed up and sealed till the time of the end as found in Daniel 12, 5 to 7. In the book of Revelation is open and the long waiting time is over. Thus, this message is important and important enough to give to Daniel and seal it in order that in the time of the end, its truths were to burst on the world with dazzling brightness. Also, this message concerns Christ and his plan of redemption for mankind so the time is also identified in the book of daniel and we find the times time and half a time mentioned in daniel 7 so we should understand the time that god is trying to tell when it is going to happen in the history of this world revelation 12 speaks of the same time period okay keep that in mind so the time period is 1260 days or years as found in Revelation 12, 6. And this is the time papal Rome shattered the power of people of God. However, the authority of the papacy to shatter, persecute all they deemed as heretics ceased in 1798, according to the time God determined. This was the time Daniel's book was opened and the people began to understand the messages contained in his prophecies and many protestants had the understanding that the 1260 years of papal reign had ended in 1798 confirming the prophecies in regard to the religious power so now the attention of the prophetic students of scripture were being turned to the 2300 day or years prophecy so as the people pondered this prophecy, there arose not only in Britain and Europe, but also in Africa and India and especially in America, several dedicated men, 
quite apart from each other, the conviction that the 2300 days would end sometime in the 1840s. Now the worldwide, you can see these studies happening in that time period. And people came to understand that 2300 days is coming to end in 1840s. Now in America, the movement was led by William Miller, in England by Edward Herring, in Asia by Joseph Wolf, and in Sweden, where the laws prohibited adults from giving the message, children preached it. You can read history. It's amazing. The words rang throughout the world, prepare to meet your Lord. People were proclaiming the second coming of Jesus Christ. The book of Daniel was opened and the little horn power being identified there of the 42 months of treading upon God's people. Now the passage we read also talks about the lion that roareth. Let us understand uh, what is this lion roaring? Verse 10 of Hosea 11 says, They shall walk after the Lord. He shall roar like a lion. When he shall roar, then the children shall tremble before from the west. Okay, now almost 3.8 also gives us a clue. The lion hath roared. Who will not fear? The Lord God hath spoken. Who can but prophecy? So now this is talking about God's voice like a roar. When he speaks, it roars. Let us read a little more because there is an add-on. It says roareth and thundereth. Okay, so let's understand this. So in, this is from Job 37, 1 to 5. And this at my heart trembleth and is moved out of this place. Hear attentively the noise of his voice and the sound that goeth out of his mouth. He directed it under the whole of heaven and is lightning unto the ends of the earth. After it, a voice roareth, he thundereth with the voice of his excellency, and he will not slay them which his voice is heard. Okay, those who hear his voice, he will not slay. Those who don't hear, he will slay. That's what it's implying. God thundereth marvelously with his voice. Great things doth he, which he, we cannot comprehend. Remember at Mount Sinai, he spoke and they heard thundering and lightning, and they were so fearful, and they said, don't talk to us, talk to Moses, and then he will talk to us. Just representing when God speaks, he roars and thunders. Another just example here in Revelation 1, 15 and 16, it says, And his feet like onto the brass, and he burned in the furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. Now, sound of many waters, again, is like the roar of a, or a roaring or a thunder. And he in his right hand has seven stars, and out of his mouth has a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance as the sun shineth in his strength. Now, just to point that even Jesus, same representation is being talked about. Just one example for want of time. So God's letter of love to all the world is what his thundering message is all about. That is why if you read the messages, it says, and I saw another angel flying, having, with a, speaking with a loud voice. Loud voice. So this is God's love's message. So this message of Revelation 14, proclaiming that the hour of God's judgment is come, is given in the time of the end. And the angel of Revelation 10 is represented as having one foot on the sea and one foot on the land, showing that the message will be carried to distant lands, the oceans will be crossed, and the islands of the sea will hear the proclamation of the last message of warning to our world. This is taken from Manuscripts Release, Volume 17, page 9. So this statement indicates that Christ himself is directing the proclamation of the first angel's message. The first angel's message was given by the early Advent preachers in the 1830s and early 1840s. Therefore, the events of Revelation 10 occurred at the same time before October 22, 1844. It was at this time that the last message of warning began to be proclaimed to the world. Okay, this is the introduction of what we're talking about in Revelation chapter 10, before we understand the thunders that God is trying to reveal. So the first angel's message is proclaimed in 1844. And you can read about that in the writings of the pen of inspiration. And historically, you can read, you can read about the events. It took place very abundantly around the world so this message was being preached fear god and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come and worship him who made the heavens and the earth that's revelation 14 7. so the first angel's message from revelation 14 7 was sounding 
1798 marked the beginning of the time of the end when knowledge would be increased and angels of Revelation 14 would begin to sound. It all pointed to the opening of the judgment. That is the message. That is why the message was proclaiming of the coming of Jesus, beginning with the judgment first. The second come of Jesus Christ begins with judgment first. So that he can choose who is fit to go with him when he comes ultimately. So that is the movement of the second coming. And that's how it happens. So a great glory, a religious awakening under the proclamation of Christ soon coming is foretold in the prophecy of the first angel's message of Revelation 14. An angel is seen flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach on them and dwell on the earth. And to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, with a loud voice, he proclaims the message, fear God and give glory to him. For the hour of his judgment is come and worship him that made heaven and earth and sea and the fountains of waters. And this is the message everyone should be preaching today. Forget about other topics of controversy that there is no agreement. People need to understand that Jesus is coming. That is important now. Don't waste unnecessary time talking about unnecessary doctrines which will divide. The devil can find people to find error in every single thing. The proclamation now is Jesus is coming and what must you do to enter God's kingdom? So let's look at the seven thunders. This mentioned there in verses 3 and 4 as well, the seven thunders of Revelation chapter 10. So after these seven thunders uttered their voices, the injunction comes to John as to Daniel in regard to the little book. Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered. These relate to future events which will be disclosed in their order. So Daniel was told to seal so that the early Advent movement people did not understand. We're going to read about that. In Revelation 10 captures Jesus Christ revealing his supreme power and authority over the whole earth. The little book he has in his hand is open and the book of Daniel is open when he cries with a loud voice as when a lion roars, then the seven thunders utter their voices. So what are the seven thunders that were sealed up? From 1840 to 1844, the message was preached with great power. But at this point, knowledge was not fully revealed and John heard seven thunders utter their voices and he understood the words those thunders uttered. Now Daniel didn't understand. He was asked to seal. Now John understands. He took up his pen and was about to record the message when he was told to seal up the message of the thunders. Now John was told, sorry, you can't send it out. Seal it up. Now let's see what uh, Bible commentary Volume 7, page 971 states, which is the writings of the pen of inspiration by Ellen White. The special light given to John, which was expressed in the seven thunders, was a delineation of events which would transpire under the first and second angel's messages. So the seven thunders are what happened between the beginning of the proclamation of the first angel's message and before the second angel's message was beginning to sound. So, before the proclamation of the second evening's message is the seven thunders, which we're going to study. So, it was not best for the people to know these things, for their faith must necessarily be tested. So, the Millerite movement was tested and shaken. They were literally shaken. And how many stood faithful? We'll find out. How many stood faithful? We'll find out. The same thing is going to happen to this last generation. Jesus is about to come. Many people are proclaiming Jesus is coming. How many are going to be able to stand? Shaking is going to happen. Serious shaking. And how many will stand? Very good example for us to learn. So let us explore now the seven thunders, years and events as revealed to us by the grace of God. So now let's just touch one verse in Matthew 24, 29, because these are the events Jesus said will happen as milestones before he comes. So here in 29, it says immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun. Tribulation is talking about the um, 42 months or the time, times and dividing of times or the 1260 days, which ended in 1798. Okay. So the sun shall be darkened 
and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken so it's saying immediately after that 1798 you will have these events happening did they happen yes they did god said it and it happened and that is also proof for us to believe that what god is saying will happen will happen including now and the imminent future so here 1755 the lisbon earthquake happens in 1776 american revolution happens in 1718 may 19 is the dark day when the, the daytime the sun was darkened and in the same night the moon was darkened in 1798 french revolution ends and in the first three of the seven time prophecies ended the 1260 the 1290 and the first of the 25 20 year principles meaning the 1335 35. okay there are so many time prophecies we need to understand so the angels message time is beginning the first angels time message is about to begin now and the first thunder time is also about to begin now based on daniel 8:14 was unsealed and the wise understand the time prophecies so now let's look at the one who was beginning to proclaim this in america so in 1818 1831 during that time period william miller is converted begin studying the bible actually to refute his deist friends now he wanted to disprove his friends and therefore he studied the bible to find error but found truth and god used him now to proclaim this event so view for the end of the 2300 days based on daniel 8:14 he got understanding applying the year day principle arriving at 1843 initially sees the 1335 days of daniel 12:12 12, ending in 1843 so all time prophecies ending by 1844 that's essentially what it implies when the, you look at the full study one more verse i want to just touch because this is the event of the second coming at the end of the seven trumpet just wanted to put at the beginning so that we don't forget verse 30 of matthew 24 says and then shall appear the sign of the son of man in heaven and then shall all the tribes of earth mourn and they shall see the son of man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory so 29 and 30 between these two verses is jammed the history that we are reading right now or studying so to say so miller applies the wounding of the papacy in 1798 at the end of the 1260 and 1290 days based on daniel 12 11 so the beginning of the time of the end daniel 11 40 and the beginning of the first angels of revelation 14 so he developed the pagan papal motif from babylon so he is one of those who established this facts of truth in 1833 beginning 10 year anti typical feast of trumpets so that brings us to 10 year which is 1843 okay we'll come to that miller begins public speaking now receives his license to preach as a baptist minister and publishes his first book on bible prophecy now evidences from scripture and history of the second coming of christ about the year ad 1844 now this is his um primary movements as he was beginning to understand prophecy and his preaching now begins to go far across america so in 1833 15 november happens also the falling of stars as we read in matthew 29 sorry matthew 24 verse 29 so in 1836 miller sees daniel 2 mixing of iron and clay as union of church and state and accepts the long tradition of catholicism as babylon and also the many divided protestant sects as laodicea and also as babylon amazing if you study history and in 1838 miller reprints evidences from scripture and history and also adopts the 10 virgins motif as applying to the world and church and then 1840 joshua v himes joins miller william miller becomes principal organizer of all the miller right movements now we come to the first thunder okay the first thunder begins at 1840 which is the sixth trumpet end so to speak where josiah lich prophesies fall of ottoman empire on august 11 and it did in 1840 october 
the first sorry in october first general conference of advent believers in boston happened this is not advent believers means this is not seventh day adventist church yet okay seventh day adventist church did not exist in 1840 this is the millerite advent believers in 1841 may miller sees the daily of daniel 8 11 to 13 as paganism connecting it to the two abominations motif now lich first uses the term adventist in a millerite paper same in 1841 in 1842 january you have william ford now he is one of those that god tried to use as a prophet but unfortunately he tried but failed william ford receives and shares two visions about the nearness of christ coming okay but he was not willing he was just kind of um inclined to do it because he was given to it but the willingness of heart mind and soul was not fully there the travels of the people of god to the new jerusalem and the glories of the new earth that was the vision that he got and then in 1842 april miller sees the sanctuary as to be cleansed in daniel 8:14 as both the earth and the church and in 1842 may second boston second advent conference definitely sets time of jesus coming as in 1843 now they decide 1843 now this picture on the right is william foy and then now the second thunder time begins what is the second thunder the proclamation of the second angel's message 1842 now churches begin closing their doors to miller but more people flocked to these meetings and his public hallways in 1842 november 1843 chart designed by charles fitch and apollos hale is published by himes fitch publishes the midnight cry to advertise miller's meetings in new york in 1843 september fitch begins the call to come out of fallen catholicism and protestantism but other millerite leaders downplayed until late in 1844 So in 1843 December Samuel Snow comes on the scene and he uses the Jewish karite timing based on the barley harvest in Judea to date the crucifixion at 31 AD and the end of 2300 days at the autumn of 1844 but other millerite leaders downplay it until after the first disappointment remember there was a first disappointment it was not a serious disappointment we'll touch that in a minute so in 1844 January the millerite signs adopts the advent herald and signs of the times as its new name and officially uses the term adventist instead of millerite to describe the believers samuel s no uses miller's understanding of the jewish feasts as types to calculate the date october 22 1844 as the anti typical day of atonement and the time of jesus coming but other millerite readers don't play it now the third thunder time period begins which is the first disappointment on 21st march 1844 to mark these events these are the seven thunders we are looking at but because of diversity of opinion on dates the faith of most believers remain strong and the fourth thunder is april of 1844 what happens this time the millerites begin to understand the tarrying time based on habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 3 as applying to their own time and the 10 virgins parable as applying to adventists and non adventists remember earlier they thought it was advent uh, the uh, believers and the world now they're talking it's about believers adventists those are waiting for jesus coming and non adventists those are still not talking about it or waiting for it or preparing for it now fifth thunder time period is the summer of 1844 when the second angel's message called come out of babylon is widely proclaimed okay now let's read one verse here in jeremiah 18 and verse 18 it says then said they come and let us devise devices against jeremiah for the law shall not perish from the priest nor counsel from the wise nor the word from the prophet come let us might him with the tongue let us not give heed to any of his words and is that happening today it is happening today many including us are proclaiming 
this warning message and how many people hearken they are going to trouble you anyway that's what we learn from the history that's what jesus says will happen and it's going to happen sooner or later so now the sixth trumpet happens in august 1844 when the midnight cry began so beginning at the exter camp meeting august 17 12 to 17 ss snow that is samuel snow exact date of october 22 for the day of atonement and the 10th day of the 7th month that is the basis generates great popular excitement which was called the 7th month movement and but lich and other leaders at that went herald remain skeptical and refused to print snow's views what happened now in 1844 august 22 snow issues his own paper entitled the true midnight cry and some weeks later his views are accepted and printed in other millerite papers and notably he suggests that jesus would return at the end of the day of atonement to bless his people now george stars introduces the conditional immortality of the soul idea again this is in 1844 august another name pops up here but before that let's look at william foy william foy receives a third vision about three platforms now but doesn't understand it and he ceases public speaking he was faithful in the beginning a little bit hesitantly faithful that is the problem don't be hesitantly faithful you either be faithful or not that is what the church of laodicea message is all about i were that you would cold or hot but you are lukewarm therefore i'll spew you out and that's what has happened here another man god wanted to use as a prophet hazen foss he also receives a vision about the three steps of heaven to heaven but fearing public scorn about visions he refuses to share it he he died an infidel if you read about his history now the time period of the seventh thunder happens on october 22 1844 great disappointment the time period of the third angel's message begins okay so now the seventh trumpet or the third war time period also begins the advent moment is reduced from 50000 people to about 50 people okay we touched the 22nd october 1844 before that's why we didn't go we're not going in detail i want us to under, understand the other aspects that need to go with it october 22 they waited on the mount of ascension from the previous day because sunset to sunset is the day according to genesis 1 that was they understood and they waited until 23rd morning just in case but jesus did not come and that's why we are still here and after this great disappointment countless people went back to their denominations which was some 7700 odd in those days in the 1840s today we have 44000 plus denominations can you see how the devil is working but what happened 50 people said no something must be wrong these are the sincere and honest people shaking happened on october 22 1844 serious shaking and for us it's going to happen again a sunday law is going to be raised up and what is going to happen how many are going to stand firm how many are going to fall back like how what happened to this 50000 people there 50 people got together and studied and said something must be wrong let us pray let us study ask god to give us understanding and the very next day look at this how god works the very next day october 23rd 1844 hiram edsam is walking in the cornfield and receives a vision about christ high priestly ministry and the later writes that the sweet bitter book experience of revelation 10 applies to this advent people or the millerite adventists amazing how god works so the seventh thunder events we continue and summarize and finish it says on november 13 advent herald suggests the great disappointment was a test to purify god's people and now jb cook advocates the idea of a shut door on october 22 1844 meaning the shutting of the um, holy place because jesus now moves into the most holy place seeing all who had participated in the seventh month movement as shut out from god's grace and lost that's what they believed 
and November 29, 1844, Enoch Jacobs, editor of the Daily Star, opposes this extreme shutdown view, holding that human provision was still open. And in December 1844, Miller accepts Cook's extreme view on the shutdown. But rumors of conversions after October 22 seem to call into question the shut door idea. Okay, let's learn a little more about the shut door. On December 1844, Ellen G. White or Ellen Gold Harmon, aged 17. If you study about her, she was a young girl going to school, third grade dropout because uh, she was being harassed by somebody and they tried to run away, she and her sister. She happened to turn back and the stone hit her face and right on her nose, breaking, and she was unconscious for so many days. Never could go back to school, but the most written author on planet Earth and the most popularly written woman in the United States and, the, in fact, uh, topmost in the whole world, so to speak. You can read about it. It's amazing how God uses the least of them. Okay, now continuing here. Ellen receives a vision that confirms the validity of the seventh month movement or midnight crime and holds the shut door applied to those who refuse to participate in that movement as well as the wicked world. Okay, probation closes if you don't accept the second coming of Jesus Christ. Simple as that in plain words. Now, Hives, that is Joshua Himes at the Law Hampton Conference of Adventists urged continuing to give the gospel to the world. Remember, this is still not Seventh-day Adventism, not the Seventh-day Adventist church that exists today. It is still the Millerite remnant of the Millerite Adventism. Now, Jacobs in the Western Midnight Christ suggests a difference between a pre-advent judgment and an executive judgment at the second advent. Now, Cook and J.D. Pickens write that the three angels' message of Revelation 14 had ended their work. Now, what we are reading is all Adventist history how the church came about and we need to understand that this church is not just another church remember this january 1845 apollo sale and joseph turner uphold the extreme shut door position they also suggest that christ as the bridegroom came in before the ancient of days to receive the kingdom as the bride now another name rachel oaks preston in 1845 being a seventh day baptist accepts the adventist doctrines accepts the adventist doctrines and joins a 40 member group they all now accept the sabbath remember prior to this they were not keeping the sabbath officially as a group as a millerite movement they were not keeping the sabbath they were a conflagration of some 700 odd people coming denominations coming together under this Baptist leader, William Miller, but they still were not having the Sabbath. They were not ready to go when Jesus came. Had he come on October 22, 1844, that is why Jesus did not come. They need to get the full truth. And that is why we are here today. So the prophetic message announces the time of the prophetic periods, but contrary to the fond hopes of those who studied this time periods it was not yet the end of the world right here in revelation 10 prophecy reveals it is not the end of all things for at the end at the point in time the seven thunders were yet sealed this also explains why they didn't fully understand what was to take place at the time until after the great disappointment after the great disappointment god revealed to them god is a merciful god so what are the seven thunders in summary to conclude the seven thunders first one is the hour of judgment is come worship the creator that's the first angel's message announce investigative judgment the second thunder is babylon the popular religion is fallen come out third thunder avoid the mark of the beast meaning false worship the fourth thunder what is it a repeat of the three with added emphasis that spiritualism has invaded the popular religions religious bodies and come out of you receive not her plagues that is the message and then fifth thunder represents christ comes to reap the earth meaning the second coming to take his faithful home the sixth thunder the angel with the sickle that is jesus christ coming down and then the seventh thunder another angel who had power of fire crying to the angel with the sickle
So that's another um, summary of what the events that transpired in, in essence in its meaning. So these two messengers declare the great battle of the thousand years and the wicked are about to receive their final reward and the wine press filled with the grapes in trodden outside the city. This city is a reference to the beloved city which the wicked as numerous as the sands of the sea march against and the holy city outside which are the wicked as found in Revelation 22, 17. So what is time no more as found in Revelation 10, 5 and 6. Let's quickly whisk through this. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven and swear by him that liveth forever and ever who created heaven and the things that are therein and the earth and the things that are therein and the sea and the things that are therein that there should be time no longer. What is it? Let's read from um, the Bible commentary, um, volume 7, page 971.7. This time, which the angel declares with the solemn earth is not the end of this world's history, neither of probationary time, but of prophetic time, which should precede the advent of our Lord. The longest prophetic time period reached to 1844. Scriptures has no more time periods. The people have no more long time periods to wait before prophecy can be fulfilled. They will not have another message upon definite time. After this period of time, Reaching from 1842 to 1844, there can be no definite tracing of the prophetic time. And the longest reckoning reaches to the autumn of 1844. What is this then? These statements have reference to the three great time prophecies of the Bible. The 70 weeks, the 1260 years, and the 2300 day time prophecies. Three serious time prophecies which we have studied. If you don't understand, go back and look at some of our studies. If you can't find other sources, you will find these time prophecies explained in a little detail. So the time periods represented by these three prophecies had to be completed before the great prophecy between, sorry, great controversy between Christ and Satan could be brought to a conclusion. Now that the last of these three time periods has completed, October 22, 1844, the great controversy could now move on to its conclusion without the restraints of time periods. We are living in serious times. So when the book was opened, the proclamation was made, time shall be no longer. That's Revelation 10.6. So the book of Daniel is now unsealed and the revelation made by Christ to John is to come to all the inhabitants of the earth. This is from Selected Messages, book two. So when the seventh, trumpet sounds. In Revelation 10, it talks about this seventh trumpet. Actually, the seventh trumpet sounded only as recorded in Revelation 11 and verse 15, but it refers to the seventh trumpet here. So let us read this. But the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as he had declared to the, his servants, the prophets. Now let us understand this. So the seventh trumpet at this point is still future. During the seventh trumpet, the mystery of God will be finished. The mystery of God is the plan and actions of salvation. It is the atonement Christ made with which, which must be declared to every son and daughter of Adam. That is to every human being on planet earth. The atonement which was purchased and provided by Christ upon the cross and finished on the great day of atonement. So in the meantime, the book is sweet. Now, just we'll touch this bittersweet experience. Verse 8 and 9, as we begin to close this chapter 10. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel, which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, and it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. What does this mean? Now with the joy, the Advent message that time should be no more went to the world. They had eaten the little book and filled their hearts and minds with it. It was sweet in the mouth. Remember that. And the joy and sweetness would turn into bitterness. The message was, it shall make your belly bitter and it shall be in your mouth sweet as honey. So the autumn of 1844 came and went. That is October 22. And the Intensity of the disappointment was beyond description. No earthly inducement ever seemed so sweet as the message of his coming. No disappointment was ever so bitter 
as that experienced by the believers in that Christ would come in 1844. Bitter, sweet experience. Verse 10. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up. And it was sweet in my mouth. And as I, soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. So continuing on the bittersweet experience, let us read this. This message has to be in thy mouth sweet as honey, but in thy belly bitter. So in the early 1800s, there were many honest and godly Bible students around the world who independent of one another were convicted that Jesus would soon return. Many of them saw in the prophecy of the 2000 years, prophecy of Daniel 8.14, a prediction that Christ would come very soon to cleanse the earth by fire. Most believe that it would be soon time in the early to mid 1800s and the most influential of these groups was led by William Miller. Determined that 1844 was the correct year and you could see the notes in Daniel 8.14 and Daniel 9.25. However, they misunderstood the event prophesied to take place in the end of the 2300 day prophecies. They had the misconception that the sanctuary to be cleansed represented the earth. This message of Christ soon return to the end all sorrow and pain was sweet in their mouths when he did not return at the appointed time that they appointed. They experienced a bitter disappointment similar to what the disciples went through when Christ had shattered their beliefs that he would set up an earthly empire as found in Luke 24, 13 to 27. So what happened? There was a misunderstanding of the cleansing of the sanctuary. So now we're going to explore the sanctuary a little bit. So the sanctuary is to be cleansed in Daniel 8, 14, is not the earth, nor is it the earthly sanctuary, which became unnecessary when Christ died once for all, as found in Hebrews 7, 27 and Hebrews 8, 9, and which no longer exists on earth. No more sanctuary services after the cross in AD 31. It is the heavenly sanctuary that is to be cleansed, referring to the time when Christ enters the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary to begin the judgment. This is what the high priest would do when in the earthly sanctuary times. Day of atonement. Right now, we are living in that awesome day of atonement, day of judgment, meaning the day of atonement. But those whose lives are being changed through the love of Jesus have nothing to fear. For Jesus is their advocate. Because now this, advent, this is judgment language. In the most holy place, judgment is happening. So he is now our advocate, not our high priest. Remember this. The shut and open door. Let's understand this a little bit. So after the disappointment, it was the understanding of the sanctuary service that helped them to see that they were correct in believing that the end of the 2300 days in 1844 marked an important crisis. But while it was true that the door of hope and mercy by which men had for 1800 years found access to God was closed, another door was opened and forgiveness of sins was offered to men through the intercession of Christ in the most holy. One part of his ministration had closed only to give place to another part of his ministration. There was still an open door to the heavenly sanctuary where Christ was ministering in the sinner's behalf. Now this is taken from early writings. Now let us, we need to understand this bittersweet experience of dwelling to eat the book. John was told to eat. Let us understand what happened in Ezekiel. Ezekiel also was told to eat. Just a little bit here, context. So the role Ezekiel 8 was symbolic of the messages God wanted him to give Israel. It is important to note that at this time, Israel were already captives of Babylon. The role Ezekiel 8 is described in Ezekiel 2.10 as being written within and without. And there was written therein lamentations and mournings and woe. Okay, we are also talking about woes here. There's three woes. We are in between the last two woes in our study today. The messages Ezekiel had to convey to God's people were not going to be desirable. Lamentations, mourning and woe were the core messages of Ezekiel was asked to deliver. Comparing Ezekiel's experience and God's desire for his, him to prophesy to God's people was amazing similarities to the message given to John the Revelator and the Advent believers. Thou must prophesy again. So the messages to be given by God's people are warnings. The judgments or trumpets of God will blow. And three of them are woes. The three angels' messages 
resound throughout the world, warning people to what? Let us look at this. So in 1844 was a great disappointment. And there were several other disappointments in the Christian history as Christ always moves in his ministration. This is caused by misunderstanding of Christ's movements in his sanctuary services. There is one disappointment, however, we must not experience, which is the close of probation. Okay, now let's look at six points of disappointments that four happened and two more can happen. Let's look at the first four that already happened. So when Christ came to the earth at his birth in a manger, the Jews were expecting a literal king, not a babe born in a manger. That's the first disappointment. The second disappointment, when he died on the cross, the disciples were disappointed because they thought he would take over the reins from the Romans. Second disappointment. Third disappointment, a remnant had caught up with his movements at Pentecost, but the vast majority were not aware of his new ministry as a priest in the heavenly temple, in the holy place. And the Jews continued their meaningless round of ceremonies in the outer court, not catching up to Christ in his dispensation of ministering in the holy place. So the Jews as a nation completely disappointed. In 1844, he shifts to the most holy place and the disappointment is clear to all of us, which we already looked at now. Yet a small remnant were keen to study and catch up with Jesus. So we looked at these four types of disappointments with the movements of Jesus in the heavenly sanctuary. Now five and six, two points we need to focus now because we are in this time period. Now, there are two of these movements that we need to focus. Number five, judgment of the dead, which began in 1844. Any who had believed in a lie of post-dead purgatorial reconciliation will be disappointed as their cases are already closed when they die. Okay, that's going to be another disappointment for many. Another last final disappointment is for those who believe and understand that you have to keep all of God's commandments and so on and so forth. Let's understand the sixth point. The closing of the sanctuary services with the judgment of the living, starting with those abiding in the most holy place, coming out to the holy place and finishing with the court. Close of probation, it's talking about. We should not miss this movement. Otherwise, we will also be disappointed. So we must catch up to Jesus, be in tandem with his movements today in the heavenly sanctuary, for we cannot afford the previous disappointments that characterized the previous generations as he moved in his various services. So verse 11 is the concluding verse of chapter 10 as we finish chapter 10. And he said to me, thou must prophesy again before many people and nations and tongues and kings. There were commissioned to preach again. Christ had not yet come. The prophetic times had come to an end, but there was still more work to be done before Christ returns. What has become known as the third angel's message of Revelation 14 must be preached in all the world. What were they to prophesy? We must remember that biblical chapter divisions were added later. The writer of Revelation tells us in the next verses what was to be the message of the disappointed believers in prophecy and what they were supposed to preach. That brings us to Revelation chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. But the primary essence of that message is found in Revelation 14, 6 to 12, so to say. So more precisely, verses 7 to 11. So here, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of judgment has come. Worship him that made heaven and earth and sea and the fountains of waters. Whom to worship? Worship the creator God, not just any God on any day. Come out of Babylon, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, that ye receive not of her plagues. Meaning, come out of false worship. Babylon. And finally, if any man worship the beast and his image, meaning papal Rome, and his image, which is Sunday, worship on Sunday, receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the shame shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. This is the message that has to go out because what they were told to prophesy, they were told to prophesy judgment is coming. And that is the essence of the first angel's message. 
So Revelation 11, 1 and 2 says this. And there was beginning given him a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles and the holy city shall be tread under foot. Forty and two months is being told prophetically what would happen. So they were commanded to measure the temple. Yet the temple, what temple is this speaking of? It's not the temple in Jerusalem because that was destroyed in 70 AD, remember. And they had thought the sanctuary was this earth. They had thought Christ would come and the earth would be cleansed with fire at the end of the time periods. But no, they were not to measure the courtyard of the temple. The courtyard where the altar of sacrifice stood represents the earth. They were not measuring the courtyard. They were measuring the altar and them that worship therein, meaning inside the temple. So how about the inner holy places of the earthly sanctuary represented the great heavenly sanctuary? Could it be possible that the sanctuary will be cleansed at the end of the 2000 of Daniel 8.14? Could be in heaven? Yes. In Hebrews 9.23, they read, it was therefore necessary the patterns of things in heaven should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. So what was to be measured in Revelation 11.1? 1? The same three things were to be measured, which were cleansed in the day of atonement. The altar, the sanctuary, and the worshippers. If you understand the day of atonement in the sacrifice of the Jewish system that God gave as a symbolic to his ministry in heaven. So now at these disappointed ones examined and evaluated what sanctuary was to be cleansed, at the end of the 2300 days, they found out that during the seventh trumpet, the temple in heaven was opened and the Ark of the Covenant was seen in heaven. And obviously this part of the temple was opened near the end of earth's history at the seventh trumpet. So the Ark of the Testament is the most holy place into which the high priest enters on the Day of Atonement. It was seen that the heavenly Day of Atonement had begun at the end of the 2300 day years in 1844, October 22, to be more precise. But why would the worshippers be measured in Revelation 11? 1? Measure means judge. In Matthew 7, 2, for with what judgment he judge, he shall be judged. And with, with what measure he meet, he shall be measured to you again. It's talking about the investigative judgment and there's so many other texts, but just put that one. So a measuring judgment is an investigative judgment, not an executive judgment. So now we see in Revelation 11, one ties together with Daniel 8, 14 and Leviticus 16. Revelation 10 takes us to the opening of the investigative judgment and a new movement sent forth with the last message to the world. Now, this is the commission of the Seventh-day Adventists. I put the logo and the name of the church here, Seventh-day Adventist Church, the current logo. So to preach the three angels' message in its fullness. Preach it again is the instruction. That means what? Second coming of Jesus Christ has to be preached with the three angels' message together as they had preached before 1844. But this time, see the sanctuary in heaven as the main focus because they did not understand what was happening in the sanctuary. They misunderstood the prophecy. The interpretation of time was correct. Time, time will never again be an issue, but focus on the heavenly sanctuary where the mystery of God is being finished. So now this is the raise of the Seventh-day Adventist church. The only church that comes through this chapter 10 or the events of October 22, 1844 and the great disappointment. The 50,000 people plus went back to their 700 odd denominations and countless of them became atheists. They stopped even believing in God. 50 people remained faithful, wanted to study. They thought they got something wrong. Let us go study more. And as a result from that 50 studying, and God revealing to them, establishing their truth, beginning with the very first day, which is Hiram Edson having the vision of the high priestly ministry of Jesus Christ, moving into the most holy place and judgment beginning, that dream, sorry, that vision in the cornfield, and subsequently other visions given to um, Ellen White. And you can see this group now begins to form 
the final God's true church. So therefore, October 22 date marked not the second coming of Christ, but rather a heavenly event. Out of this group arose the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this interpretation of the great disappointment forms the basis for the Seventh-day Adventist doctrine of the pre-Advent divine investigative judgment. So a couple of events here. After 1844, in 1860, the remnant was given the name Seventh-day Adventist. In 1863, the organization of the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists happened. In 1872, the Declaration of the Fundamental Principles taught and practiced by the Seventh-day Adventists is published at Battle Creek, Michigan. So the original, this is the original logo of what the Seventh-day Adventist Church used in history. Okay, so now, so the beginning of the investigative judgment happens. So the two groups of people are mentioned here, them that worship and the Gentiles in Revelation 11, 1 and 2. We read that. So the first group represents God's true church, spiritual Israel, while the second represents the false of the corrupt church that professes to worship God, but is not true to him. God's true people are measured or judged while the others are not. The pre-Advent judgment, which began in 1844, is just like the ancient Jewish Day of Atonement in that the ones, only ones being judged are those who have confessed their sins and had them transferred to the temple. Accordingly, this judgment is to determine whether those who profess to be Christians are really Christ's faithful people. What else happens? The holy city represents God's true church, also called Jerusalem, Isaiah 52, 9. And we see in verse 7, it's opposite. The great city called in Revelation 18, Babylon, which is a, any system of false religion. You can read Revelation 18, and it all talks about papal system, so to say. The false church is seen to tread the true church underfoot for 40 and two months. This refers to the same 1260 year period of papal domination as seen in Daniel 7, 25 and Daniel 8, 10 and 23 to 25. So at the time appointed for the judgment, the close of the 2300 day, 1844, began the work of investigation and blotting out of sins, the day of atonement, judgment. All who have ever taken upon themselves the name of Christ must pass its searching scrutiny. Both the living and the dead are to be judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. That is Ecclesiastes 12, 13 and 14. You can read that and understand. What about this measuring rod? What does it mean? God's law is a revelation of his nature. It defines how he lives. If we want to be in his kingdom and live as he does, we must obey his law. Yet obeying God's law in no way minimizes his grace. God first gives us the redeemer and then asks us to walk in his commands. That is grace and law. The frees, he frees his people from their slavery to sin, then says, go and sin no more. For sin is the transgression of the law. Remember that. Live according to the standard of his law. Grace precedes the law. But obedience will result in true religion has taken root in the life. Serious points to consider. So 1 Peter 4, 17 and 18 talks like this. For the time has come for judgment has begun at the house of God. And if it begins first with us, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Shocking statements by God. We need to consider. Those that worship are literal Jews worshiping in a literal temple. They are not. But those who direct their worship to the heavenly temple where Christ ministers in behalf of his children, as you find in Hebrews chapter 8. What about the court of the temple that's being left out and trodden? This court of the temple, which stood the altar of sacrifice and the labor, it represents the earth in contrast to the temple of God in heaven. So the court typified Christ's work upon earth, his baptism and his sacrifice upon the cross. So the courtyard of Jerusalem temple was divided. Inner courts for the worship, Jewish worshippers and a large outer court for the Gentiles. You can see the picture on the right. And then you see the symbolism here is that the true worshippers were looking at the heavenly sanctuary while the unconsecrated ones are in the outer court and the phrase time of the Gentiles 
is in an apocalyptic setting so luke 24 sorry luke 21 24 says and they shall fall by the edge of the sword and they shall be led captive into all nations and jerusalem shall be trodden down of the gentiles until the times of the gentiles be fulfilled okay now that's the prophecy talking about the trampling of the god's people so if turn in daniel to see a lot of trampling going on in chapter 7 and chapter 8 the connection points to the trampling of the holy place and its host in daniel the agent doing the trampling is an extension of the roman empire which reveals itself as both a religious and political power that causes desolation as found in daniel 7 and daniel 8 and daniel 11 and daniel 12 you can read those verses it attempts to reach into heaven itself, observing Christ's daily ministry and casting truth to the ground. It reaches into heaven, the true place of the sanctuary, and casts the place of the sanctuary to the ground, claiming power over it and trampling on it. This is identifying papal Roman power. The time, times, and times that has been mentioned. Let's quickly touch this a little bit. So the oppressive power is given a set time in prophecy during which the saints suffer under its trampling. A time times and half a time or half three and a half years as found in Daniel 7 and Daniel 12. This time period equals 42 months and thus establishes a specific link between Daniel 7 and Revelation 11. To make it even clearer, Revelation 11 defines that time in two different ways. 42 months in verse 2 and 1260 days in verse 3. 42 prophetic months of 30 days yields 1260 days if you do the maths 12 42 into 30 this in turn links this time of trampling with revelation 12 6 and 14 as well so this shows us this trampling by the gentiles is the trampling of god's true church in the wilderness by papal rome 538 to 1798 was the time that you had on the side if you just sorry if you just look back Justinian gave power in 538 AD, Roman, uh, Eastern Roman Empire, and uh, Napoleon's general Berthier came and took the Pope into Pope Pius VI into prison and captivity when the power came down. 1260 years of trampling happened. So, who are the two witnesses? Let us uh, touch this. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days, clothed in sackcloth. And these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before God and the earth. So the foundational witnesses of, for truth for the Old and New Testament, both are witnesses to plan of salvation. Both are important testimonies to the origin and perplexity of the law of God. Both witness to the covenant of promise. One points forward to the promised Savior, the other reveals of his life, death, and resurrection. Both witness to great battle between good and evil and the final restitution of all things. The two testaments, New Testament and the Old Testament. So the two witnesses which are said to be the two olive trees and two candlesticks represent the Old and New Testaments. The olive trees represent the power of the Holy Spirit and the candlesticks symbolize the spiritual light of the scriptures. So the two, you can read that in these verses, Psalms and Zechariah. The two witnesses were to prophesy in sackcloth symbolizing mourning and the Bible was not readily available to the common people. So there are two reasons or few reasons for this. Let us understand this. It was only available in Hebrew, Greek and Latin in that time period. We're talking 538 AD to 1798 AD time period. And it had to be occupied by hand. It had to be copied by hand. So there were only few copies available. And during services, scripture reading and sermons were in Latin. And church stands was that since the common people could not understand the Bible, the clergy must interpret it for them. Now, this is the Papal Rome Church. Even after the Bible was translated into common language of the people, the church forbade them to read it. Remember, we talked about it. John Wycliffe translated it in the 1300s and it was available for everybody to read in English, but they were still forbid to read it. So what does the prophesying in sackcloth mean? So in the Council of Tolosium in 1229 under Pope Gregory IX, we read in Canons 14 and 2, we prohibit, see this is what the law was, we prohibit lawmen, laymen 
possessing copies of the Old and New Testament. We forbid them most severely to have the above books in the popular vernacular, meaning in their own languages. The lords of the district shall carefully seek out the heretics in dwellings. Those who are reading the Bible are called heretics here. Hovels and forests and even their underground retreats shall be entirely wiped out. It's going to come again. This history is going to repeat again. The church now plays down the brutality, the inquisitions, etc. But the truth is, they did not want the common people studying the Bible on their own as it would lessen their control over the people as it is even happening now. Those who read the Bible, understand it, will find out that they have to keep Sabbath because they're truthfully seeking truth. But today, majority of believers don't truthfully seek truth. That is the problem, the devil's deception. You just believe and you think by God's grace you're going to be saved. No, it is not that simple. Study God's word, understand his requirements, not some church's requirements. The French Revolution happens now. Revelation 11, 7 to 10 is the French Revolution. So when we shall have finished their testimony, the beast that descended out of the bottomless pit, this is Satan, shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. Remember, now when Satan saw that his power was going down through the papal power, which he gave his seat and authority as found in Revelation 13, verse 2, now he raises another power which is atheism we're going to see this and the dead body shall lie in the streets of the great city which spiritually is called sodom and egypt where also our lord was crucified and they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nation shall see the dead bodies three days and of half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be cut in graves we're talking about the bible still old testament new testament what happened in the french revolution and they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets now they're called prophets they were called witnesses earlier now they're called prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth meaning they're correcting their sinful ways of life and they did not want that they called it torment so at the end of the 12,260 years, when the two witnesses have finished prophesying clothed in sackcloth, the beast comes out of the bottomless pit to make war against them and kill them. The excesses of the corruption of the papal church system and the church-supported aristocracy got so bad that their firmest supporter, France, became their worst enemy. This nation not only rejected Catholicism, but God himself altogether. They cast out all morals and everything Christian and set up a new religion glorifying man, reason, and the intellect of the so-called gods. Now, during this reign of terror, there was a time period you can read in history books. It's called the reign of terror in France. So the Bible was not only openly rejected, but also was publicly forbidden and publicly burnt for three days and a half. That's what the Bible said. This symbolizing the literal three and a half years, the Bible would appear to be dead. For three and a half years, the revolutionaries of France did all in their power to oppose and destroy their Bible. They, in fact, went against God, against the creation, against the Sabbath rest we talked about, six days creation, seventh day Sabbath rest we talked about. They made it 10 days. Look at what they did, just as a snapshot. They started a new Republican calendar starting on September 21, 1792. Okay, was the day one and year one of their new Republican calendar. The months based on reason, named after seasons. Okay, 30 days were in a month. That was typically what the Jewish calendar presented and they were right in some of the aspects. 10 days in a week, never existed they wanted to defy god they came up with it and the study of the french revolution is also there in some of our presentations you can study more and understand animals were dying people were falling sick they had to revert back to the seven days week so new secular holidays happened the hatred of traitors and tyrants and festival of the supreme being their goal was to simply stamp out christianity so france embraced an atheistic philosophy or religion, so to say, and became part of the great city of false religions. Its characteristics are symbolized by Sodom and Egypt, and also our Lord was crucified. Sodom is a notorious biblical symbol for sexual perversion, and this happened during the 
post revolution time period genesis 19 4 to 11 talks about it and jude 7 talks about it and egypt symbolizes atheism who is the lord that i should obey his voice to let israel go remember before the plagues during the 10 plagues of egypt what pharaoh was saying can exam exodus 5 2 where also our lord was crucified represents christ crucified in the person of his faithful followers when they are persecuted so when god's people are persecuted it represents that christ was crucified it's telling that he was crucified therefore you're killing my people you can read that in john 13 and matthew and in hebrews those who once loved christ and are guilty of willfully apostasy are said to crucify the son of god afresh you know, France, during the French Revolution, embraced sectional licentiousness and atheism, rejected the Bible and persecuted all Christians, both the true Christians and the false together, meaning the Catholic, uh, papal Roman um, uh, church followers and the Protestant followers. That's what is being presented here. So God restores these uh, two witnesses. God is amazing. Well, Satan is working. God works too. So after the three and a half days and a half uh, spirit of life from God entered into them and they stood up upon their feet and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, come up hither and they ascended up to heaven in the cloud and their enemies beheld them. Now what is this? It simply means this. The scene here is of the two witnesses as they were given new life they exalted in the sight of their enemies. So after the French Revolution, Protestant Europe looked back on its extremes with disgust and sought with fervent effort to elevate the Bible to greater prominence than ever before. So now the British Bible Society was established in 1804 and the American Bible Society was established in 1816 and began distributing large numbers of Bibles. In 1804, the total number of Bibles in circulation was about 4 million in over 50 languages. Today, there are billions of Bibles in hundreds of languages, making it to the world's most widely circulated book. God's prophecy comes to end. Let's finish off uh, on a brief note, the seventh trumpet. So now the scene turns to the seventh of the seven trumpets. This is the time period that begins at AD 40, 1840, August 11, where the sixth end trumpet comes to an end with the fall of Ottoman Empire. And this will end at the second coming of Jesus Christ. And this will bring the final destruction of Jesus' third enemy, which is Papal Rome. So we live in this time period today. We live in this time period today and time is running out. That's what I want to say at the fourth set. So here at the introduction, I want to say this: the second war, six trumpet ended in 1840, the close of the marked by the transfer of Muslim power into the hands of the Western nations. The chapter attached to the sixth trumpet revealed the great changes which were occurring in the world. The fight for freedom and liberty raged strong in the centuries that preceded 1840. The power of papacy had been broken. America won her freedom from European control and opened up a whole new life, new style of government honoring the freedoms of the individual, separating church from state and granting freedom of religion. And indeed the nations were angry, but now there is a peace and a freedom that will allow the last final message to be proclaimed to the world. Revelation 10 showed the beginnings of the last warning messages and announced that in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall give to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as he has declared to his servants the prophets so now verse 15 begins the seventh trumpet and the seventh angel sounded and there were great voices in heaven saying the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our lord and of his christ and he shall reign forever and ever so daniel 7 13 14 tells us when christ is brought before the ancient of days of the investigative judgment he is given dominion and glory and a kingdom and all people nations and languages would serve him his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom which shall not be destroyed. So through Christ, this greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. You can read that in Daniel 7.25. And this is the focus of the seventh trumpet, just as the main focus of Daniel 7 was upon the son of man receiving his dominion. So now the scene continues. 
verse 16 and 17 of Revelation 11, and the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give him thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art, which was, and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and has reigned. So again, the prophet sees the conclusion. The 24 elders who were present before God's throne at Christ's ascension and witnessed his inauguration, exclaiming, Worthy, worthy is the lamb that was slain, and who had served with their bowls of full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Worship him who is crowned king of kings. And their song in chapter 5 was, You have redeemed us to God by your blood. You have made us unto our God kings and priests and shall reign on the earth. What joy! They express that Christ has redeemed them and bought back the lost inheritance. Their joy is reflection of the great joy of all the redeemed, while experience of Christ receives the kingdom which he won back with his own blood. Verse 18. This is the penultimate verse. Verse 18 is the verse before the last verse in Revelation 11 to finish this topic. And the angels and the nations were angry and the wrath was come and the time of the dead that they should be judged and that there should be reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints and them that fear thy name as a small and great and should us destroy them which destroy the earth. So both Daniel and Revelation reveal the turmoil of earth's nations as they struggle against each other, seeking to grasp the dominion of the earth, seeking to gain the world at the expense of their souls each trying to subjugate the citizens of the earth under their control by force. It is happening right now. Right now. Just want to touch some points of the past, not what is happening now. This is not the only way that this is the war of Rome. These verses show us that dead are being judged. So how is this a war to Rome? The saints and prophets are honored by their names being kept in the book of life as part of Jesus' kingdom. Think of the hundreds of thousands of people tortured to death and massacred in the dark ages. They are placed in the list to receive their reward, eternal life with Jesus. But what about those who killed them? What about those haughty church leaders who prevented to be, who pretended to be God's agents? This is when the hidden things of darkness are made plain. Mystery of God being revealed completely. Evil men, have done many horrible deeds and they thought because the people who knew about it were all killed that nobody knew what they had really done. But this woe is the time when all the records are open on those who have pretended to be Christians and their wicked deeds are all written there. Remember, from the time a child is born till the person dies, every deed is recorded. If you did wrong, you confess and repent. It will be wiped out of your record. If not, it remains there. Here is a photo of three skeletons that were found buried beneath the hall floor of a cathedral in Russia. They were found when the authorities demolished this old Catholic church to build a nuclear power plant. It looks like it was a young boy and his three parents laid out there. There were hundreds of hidden skeletons in this old church when they demolished. Who were they? We don't know. But the watcher, the holy one who wrote on Belshazzar's wall, no, knows it is all coming out in the investigative judgment. Indeed, it is a woe on all who have done evil while professing to belong to God. Nothing is overlooked. Not even a little child who loved Jesus and was killed by wicked people is forgotten. All the true will receive reward and all the false will be blotted out from the book of life. So it is while people are still living on earth that the work of investigative judgment takes place in the courts of heaven. Christ is presenting his subjects before the heavenly court. All are examined according to the book of the record of the books of heaven to see if they are clothed in garment of Christ's righteousness. Their sins confessed and repented, covered by his blood, their lives and hearts yielded to his will. That is the requirement God wants or heaven wants, if you want to use that term. The time of judge the dead is seen in Daniel 7, which takes place soon after the 2000, 1260 years when the heavenly court gathers about the ancient of days. The books are opened and the court is in session. 
This is the court before which the Son of Man is brought to receive the dominion and the kingdom. And this court where the saints through Christ become citizens of his kingdom. This is the court where Christ confesses the names of his overcoming saints before the Father and before the angels. Last verse and we finish. Revelation 11, 19. And the temple of God was opened in heaven and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and earthquake and great hail. So the ark of God's testament is in his holy of holies. The second apartment of the sanctuary is the ministration of the earthly tabernacle which served under the example of the shadow of heavenly things. This apartment was opened only upon the day of great day of atonement for the cleansing of the sanctuary, that's October 22, 1844. Therefore, the announcement that the temple of God was opened is in heaven during the seventh trumpet and the ark of his testament was seen points to the opening of the most holy place in the heavenly sanctuary at the end of the 2,300 days or years, according to Daniel 8, 14. And those 2,300 years point to the 1844, October 22, as Christ entered here, there to perform the closing work typified by the day of atonement now let's look at uh, a little more of what happened in the past of why papal rome is the third and final enemy of jesus that will be destroyed so as a result of the vision of fatima pope Pius 12 ordered his nazi army to crush russia and the orthodox religion and make russia roman catholic a few years after his he lost world war ii Pope Pius XI startled the world with his phony dancing sun vision to keep Fatima in the news. It was a great religious showbiz and the world swallowed it. Let's look at this account. You can find this in history books. The Miracle of the Sun, also known as the Miracle of Fatima, is reported to have occurred on 13 October 1917 and attended by a large crowd who had gathered in Fatima, Portugal. It's a small village. In response to a prophecy made by three children, Luis Santos and Francisco and Jacinta Marta. Now this is the shrine that was erected in Fatima as a result of these apparitions as seen by these children and uh, the Pope. Now here, this is called the shrine of Our Lady Fatima in Portugal. It exists today and it is the second largest pilgrim center for Roman Catholics. But look at the shocking um, points that we're going to make next. So the Jesuits, okay, now these are all the working of the Jesuits. The Jesuits wanted Russia involved and the location of this vision at Fatima could play a key part in pulling Islam to the mother church, meaning Roman Catholic church. So in 1917, the Virgin Mary appeared in Fatima. That's what they claim. The mother of God, that's what they claim, was a smashing success, playing to overflow crowds. As a result, the socialists of Portugal suffered a major defeat. We're talking politics again. So the Roman Catholics worldwide began praying for the conversion of Russia and the Jesuits invented the novenas to Fatima which they could perform throughout North Africa, spreading good public relations to the Muslim world. The Arabs thought they were honoring the daughter of Muhammad. We touched this in the sixth trumpet. They named the village Fatima after Prophet Muhammad's daughter. Now what happens? The Jesuits wanted them. Can you see this common name? Of Fatima today you would find as an evidence to this in both Islam and in Roman Catholicism people have this common name Fatima interesting the Ark of the Covenant in heaven we conclude with this we read in verse 19 of chapter 11 thunderings earthquake and hail so the loud preaching of the warning message of god is thunderings because god's voice is thunderings an earthquake is a great time of war and persecution just before jesus return it's talking about destruction earthquake is destruction and great hail is the final of the seven last plagues remember we studied the plagues you can go and study that's what it represents the final hail one hail is the size of 62 
pounds, roughly about, uh, some people claim it's about 30 kilos of uh, hailstone falling from heaven. So you see that this war leads to the end of papal Roman power forever and the second coming of Jesus to gather his children home. Do you see why this is such an important time that we're living in today? Soon the living will be judged and let's choose to be faithful. So Jesus will be given each one of us to be in his kingdom. So the summary is simply the time of the seventh trumpet begins with the heavenly judgment and it extends into eternity, covering the events of the last days. This is the time when the heavenly high priest who holds the golden censer filled it with fire of the altar just like the earthly priest would do just before they enter the most holy place on the day of atonement. It is also the time when he comes out and casts the censer into the earth and where there are voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. Now this is the introduction we touched of the day of Pentecost based on this topic and it's going to happen literally again when Jesus comes the second time. Amazing how God reveals what he does. So finally, to conclude, it says, when the censor is cast down, mediation ceases. The seven last plagues fall. As the thunders and lightnings of earthquake shatter the earth, the commandments are seen again, displayed in the sky. Every eye that lives that day will see the commandments shown in the whole sky. We studied about this as well. Go study our previous presentations. This time, there is no Ark of the Covenant with a mercy seat. As God formerly revealed his law amid thunder and lightning at Mount Sinai, he will again proclaim his law from the heavens in terrible majesty. Says the prophet, the heaven shall declare his righteousness for God is judge himself. Amazing. So just summary of the three woes. So the first war, the armies of Islam were attacking Western Rome and suddenly and without warning, that's what we saw in Western Rome, Eastern Rome was destroyed. And then you see in the second war, you again see the armies of Islam attacking Eastern Rome suddenly and without warning with explosives and they were destroyed. And in the third war, you see again also the likes of September 11, 2001 with forces of Islam attacking suddenly without warning and with explosives and are attacking us which formed a secret agreement with the vatican to bring down the ussr in 18 1989 and therefore can be considered part of rome's armies oh shocking shocking history if you read all of history it is amazing that's just a summary of the three woes as we close what is it for us today all kingdoms have laws every kingdom has laws there are rules you live in a nation there are rules Whatever you do in your working, there are rules. Everywhere there are rules. And God's kingdom of God is the perfect law. The law was etched in stone by the finger of God himself and is now in the Ark of the Covenant, still under the mercy seat where Christ's blood has pardoned and repentant transgressor. When on earth Christ said to his disciples, I have kept my father's commandments. By his perfect obedience, he has made it possible for every human being to obey God's commandments. When we submit ourselves to Christ, the heart is united with his heart, his, the will is merged with his will, and our minds are filled with heavenly thoughts. We walk with him in paths of righteousness. This is what it means to be clothed with the garments of his righteousness, accepting his forgiveness, his merits, and walking with him in his paths of righteousness. His subjects will declare, I delight to do thy will. Oh God, yes, thy law is within my heart. That's Psalms 40 and verse 8. For those who claimed belief in the Redeemer and remained faithful, Jesus represents them. Those who do not remain faithful or who claimed to be God's while following their own ways have no one to represent them. They are blotted out in the book of life because Jesus right now is sitting as a judge and advocate, not a high priest. We are living in the time of the seventh trumpet when Jesus is receiving his kingdom. Soon the process will be finished and he'll come to take his people home. So while the final countdown for this earth zeroes the, nears the zero hour, every person on earth is making decisions that will determine his or her eternal destiny. Millions are wondering which way to turn, what choices to make. And those who know should tell others. 
So the overcomer is individual Christian who enjoys special benefits in eternity for refusing to give up his faith in spite of persecution during earth. There is a choice to make. So people need to know so that they can make the choice because people are in darkness today because they don't study the word of God, the Bible. Study the Bible and you will see and ask God to give you understanding and the Holy Spirit will reveal what God wants us to know because the devil doesn't want us to do that because he's like a roaring lion seeking whom he devour because he knows he has a short time. Enter the ark of hope. That is what I keep saying all the time. The ark of hope for this generation or the anti-deluvian generation, Noah's ark, after that, it is the ark of the covenant. And it, you have the Ten Commandments, you have Aaron's rod, and you have the pot of manna. Judgment is the basis what is in the ark of the covenant. Enter this ark of hope. Jesus says, other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. And that is what we're trying to do here. Calling people to come to the fold of God. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. Jesus is knocking on your door. Are you willing to open? Because he's going to come. Whether one likes it or not, whether one believes it or not, whether one is ready or not, whether one is prepared or not, he's going to come. He's not going to wait too long. So while probation still lasts, confess and repent and ask God to forgive and ask him to lead and guide and mold and fashion. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Let us pray. Mighty God, King of the universe, Heavenly Father, thank you for your words you have revealed so that we can understand today. Help us to study so that we can be informed and with informed knowledge, we can seek your grace to prepare with the leading of your Holy Spirit in our lives for your soon return. Oh Lord, before our names are looked upon, May you grant us this grace that we would examine our lives. And until we meet again, keep us faithful. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you all for joining. Thank you all for studying together with us. May God be with you all. And as you study more and prepare for such a time as we are living in. God be with all of you.